Hello, MUS 201 students. As you can tell, I am not here today. I am currently about an hour and a half outside of Spokane at Washington State University, where I am doing a premiere. But fortunately for you, I have pre-recorded this lecture to go over a really important topic, mic placement and stereo techniques. There will be a quiz on this, so please pay attention. And in fact, that quiz will occur next week. So be sure to pay attention, take notes, and download the PDF of the slides for your own studying purposes later on. But let's start off with mic placement. Everybody knows the difference between different types of mics now. We've got dynamic, condenser, and ribbon. And we've talked about polar patterns and how those are used to pick up sound and how they display that information to you as the sound engineer. But how do we put them all together? Well, that's what we're talking about here. So first and foremost, here's the equation to consider. It's not enough to just have great gear. And even having the best mic locker in the world will not make a great recording. It's a sum of a number of factors. Specifically, the player and the instrument are the most important thing when you're recording. You can have a great player with a terrible instrument and it will be okay. You can have a wonderful instrument and a terrible player, not so much. But if you have a great player and a great instrument, you're about halfway there. The room and the reverb response counts for about 20% of the quality of the recording. This is just kind of a factor. If, for example, you want to record brass instruments, you want a room that has a pretty decent amount of reverb. Stone on the walls, high ceilings, hard stone floor, no carpeting or anything to go through and uh, get rid of some of that uh, reflection. Conversely, if you're recording say a singer, you want a room that is going to block out all sorts of external noises, uh, an ISO booth or an otherwise acoustically treated room. Uh, next, the mic position and bleed control. This cannot be understated at all. This is super important. How are you pointing the mic at the sound source? It sounds simple, but it can actually become pretty challenging, especially when you have bleed, like when you're trying to record a six-part mariachi band that's all in the same room, and you have to deal with the fact that the violin is quieter than the trumpet, and the singer has a mild sore throat that day, and so they can't belt it out like they normally could. Final part of the equation is the mic itself. This is only about 10% of the total uh, some of the factors that goes into making a good recording. Yes, some mics do have more distinctive sounds, and some will be better for certain tasks. For example, using a dynamic mic to get really close to an amp. That works great. If I did that with a condenser, I'd probably blow out my preamp. But the mic itself, while it has a characteristic sound, is not necessarily the biggest factor. It's just one of many. The next part that you want to take into consideration is working hard to avoid phase cancellation. Phase cancellation can be heard as a noticeable lack of bass in the mix when you're recording from a stereo pair. Typically, you'll just hear no bass, or very little, or it might sound a little muddy. If that happens, flip the phase inversion switch on your console or on your preamps, and hopefully that will take care of it immediately. But we'll talk about some strategies to fix that later on. For the fundamentals, the first thing to consider is the room position. Where in the room does the instrument or voice sound the best? And this will change from room to room. Uh, other concerns that you need to have that you have to balance are, can you, from your position in the control room or at a table in the room, see the performer? Can the other band members see the performer? There is nothing harder to do than to make a recording where no one can see each other. You just you lack all the 
visual and uh, nonverbal cues that a band has. The other thing is their major signal bleed. Yeah, the vocalist might sound really awesome sitting right next to the bass amp, but you're going to get a lot of that amp noise coming through onto the vocal track. The way that you check the sound of the room is by walking around and clapping your hands to find the best, most even reverb with no extra boings or overtones. This takes a little bit of practice, but is something that you just kind of learn by doing. Try the place in the room where the ceiling is the highest. There's less chance of early reflections and phasing in the reverb as a result. Avoid positioning the vocalist or the instrument in a corner. This is because corners tend to reinforce bass frequencies similar to the idea of the proximity effect, but because there's just a little bit of bounce off of the walls, it's also way more boomy. Big thing though, do not get close to a wall. The best places to record are going to be a couple feet away. And that's very important because, again, you're avoiding early reflections, which will add just a little bit of uh, delay to the signal. Then another big one, stay away from glass. Yes, the control room will probably have a glass plate looking into the studio, but you don't want to be directly putting a mic there because, again, you're going to get early reflections. If you have no other choice, set the performer up at a 45 degree angle to the glass because that way the mic will be off access and it will deaden some of those early reflections. This works okay with glass, it does not work okay with walls, so this will only work on the glass. Another consideration is to invest in some rugs. Go down to your local carpet store and buy carpet remnants. The cheapest ones you can possibly find, they don't have to be good because in a studio they're probably going to get destroyed eventually. People will spill things on them, they'll get sticky, covered with pop or energy drinks or other substances that the band might choose to ingest and that you probably should not let them do. Uh, but, especially under the drums, rugs are awesome at canceling early reflections from hard floors. They're also very useful with voices or instruments that resonate and just sound a little bit more boomy in the room. Another thing is to elevate the amps. Put them on a chair, put them on a case, get some foam blocks from uh, Michael's or Hobby Lobby, whatever, it doesn't matter, you know, stack a couple pillows under them, just get them off of the floor themselves. I recommend uh, taking the foam packaging used in shipping a lot of musical gear. Just take it, get a razor blade and some duct tape, and cut it. Uh, not the styrofoam though, the actual foam foam. The styrofoam will crack and break and doesn't really deaden the sound of uh, the early reflections that well. The next thing that's important is choosing a microphone. Here's the problem. <laughs> There's no right mic for every situation and we all have our favorites. So be prepared to change and experiment. Keep in mind that sometimes a cheap mic might work out better than an expensive one. If for example you're recording guitar amps and the player has amped everything up to 11, use an SM57. You don't need to drop $1500 on a Royer 121 you'll get a better sound with the dynamic. Uh, other things to consider are using a mic that complements the instrument. Are you recording a violin that's playing pretty extremely high-end and kind of on the edgy side? Use a mellower sounding mic. Uh, is the instrument too weak sounding in the initial uh, mix and the initial scratch take? Use a mic that has a higher end uh, boost. Look at the charts that the manufacturers provide and select one that emphasizes frequencies above 10K. That will help the instrument to come through a little bit better. Is the mic free or diffuse field? This is important. A free field mic allows sound sources to dominate the mic. 
Uh, they tend to be flatter in the higher frequencies and may need to be closer to the source, but conversely, they're not diffuse. Diffuse mics, usually the room reflections play a larger role in the mic. They typically boost the high registers and sound a little bit flat when far away from the source. So take a look at your mic specs. Also, and this is really important, use a mic that's not going to be overloaded. Dynamic mics are awesome for drums and amps. Ribbon mics work really well on acoustic strings like mandolin, uke, acoustic guitar, or banjo. Condenser mics work great on instrumental sections like strings, woodwinds, or brass, or even as a pair to record the orchestra itself. Don't use the wrong type on the wrong instrument. Also, take a look at the polar patterns that you're using and use those to minimize bleed at all costs. Do you have a bunch of amps stuck next to each other? You probably don't want to use an Omni mic. Consider the proximity effect. If it's an issue, seriously consider switching to an Omni mic if you are able to without getting additional bleed. This actually works really well. Proximity effect is the boost in bake, uh, bass frequencies when you have a condenser mic too close to the sound source. However, Omni mics do not have the same susceptibility to the proximity effect, even if it's condenser. So if you can use an Omni capsule instead and still get in exactly where you need without getting any bleed, that will work. And then keep in mind that a large diaphragm condenser is not necessarily better than a small diaphragm condenser. That's one of the myths we talked about a couple weeks ago. It just means that's how the manufacturer created them. It doesn't mean that one will pick up bass frequencies better than the other or that one is inherently better than the other. I have small diaphragm condensers that I vastly prefer over some of my large diaphragm ones and vice versa. Next, let's talk about finding the sweet spot. First and foremost, when you get in and start setting up mics, your EQ settings should be completely flat. Ideally, we want a perfectly flat horizontal line for our EQ curve. You will touch this after recording, or if during the initial setup, you just need to boost something a little bit in the high end or maybe cut the low end. But by and large, you're not going to touch it at this stage. Instead, what you're going to do is experiment. Do a couple of test placements and recordings, then listen to them. Also, you can walk around with one ear covered or with your hands cupped behind the ears and listen to see where the best spot to place a mic is. For an Omni mic, cover one ear completely with your hand and listen with the other, whichever you hear better out of. Move around to find where the instrument sounds the best in the room and place the mic there. You'll probably be fairly close to the instrument though. For a cardioid mic, cup a hand behind one ear and listen. Again, move around until you find the best spot. For a stereo pair, cup your hands behind both ears and listen. Move around again and find the best spot, and this will determine where you put the stereo pair. Ideally, they'll be on one mic stand with a stereo bar. Couple of general techniques. Close miking is best to avoid bleed, but you still need to let the sound develop a bit away from the instrument or the sound source. You can't have the mic physically touching, basically. And again, condensers are susceptible to the proximity effect and the boost in bass. Give the mic a few inches, maybe even a foot or more. Do a test recording and listen. Number two, you cannot place mics by sight unless you really know the performer, the room, the mics, and the signal chain like the back of your hand. And even then, using just your sight to place mic is a good starting point, but you still need to move them around and test them 
as every recording session will be different, even everything else considered and constrained. Another consideration, do you need reflections from the room or reinforcement for a stereo pair? Well, place the stereo pair first, then add spot mics for additional support. While you're setting these up and doing test recordings, monitor the EQ usually between 200 and 600 hertz, typically centered around 300. In addition to being a huge problem spot where instrumental ranges overlap, this is where the proximity effect boost is the most noticeable place for it to occur. If you see it or hear it on your DAW, move the mics away further from the source. Finally, don't overdo the volume. You can get a larger sound by recording quieter and then boosting, or by plugging into a smaller amp than a full stack, especially when you're recording metal and they want that classic overdriven sound. Now, let's talk about phase cancellation. This is a big issue and will plague you for the rest of your lives while you're recording. Phase refers to how the peaks and troughs of a signal interact with each other. If you're looking at two waveforms and they rise and fall perfectly in phase with each other, they reinforce each other. Effectively, you hear them as rising and falling as one. If, however, they're out of phase, one might be pushing while the other is pulling in opposite directions. And if you have an identical waveform exactly 180 degrees out of phase, the end result is that this pushing and pulling against each other will result in total silence, although this is extremely rare. There are two types of phase cancellation that you have to really be worried about, electrical cancellation and acoustic. Electric cancellation is almost always caused by a cabling issue. Check the polarity by using the phase inversion switch to change the phase 180 degrees. On an XLR cable, basically what this is doing is swapping pins two and three. To test the phase, pick a mic in the setup that can be easily moved and sounds good already. This is gonna be your reference mic. Move the reference so it touches the kick drum mic. Speak into them from about a foot away don't play the kick drum because that might inadvertently affect the mic. Now, bring up both faders so the volume is equal in your kick drum mic and your reference mic. For the non-reference mic, flip the phase switch and listen. Choose the position of the phase switch, either on or off, that gives you the most bass. Then, move the reference mic to the next mic and repeat this with all the other mics. This generally helps to get rid of any electric cancellation. Acoustic cancellation is usually caused by two mics being way too close to each other and picking up the same source with a slight delay. With acoustic phasing, the frequencies will only cancel out at certain points depending on the source. This makes it sound hollow or lacking in depth specifically in the bass frequencies. However, in the upper registers, you're less likely to hear this happen. To deal with this, move one mic a little further away, and if both mics are directional, make sure that they are looking directly at the source sound. Another way to deal with this, just in general, is the three to one rule. This will absolutely be on the tests coming up. This is a great way to eliminate phase issues before they start. The rule itself is that a second mic should never be within three times the distance that the first mic is from its source. So if you're recording a guitarist and your first mic is two feet away from the guitar, then the second should be six feet away. This is not a hard and fast rule. It's just a good starting point. And there's multiple ways to interpret it. You could have the mic six feet behind the first mic, or you could have it six feet to the side of the first mic. Other problems that will come up from phasing, 
Typically, you will notice the phasing is because the mics are facing each other directly. The capsule of one mic is looking into the capsule of another one. Or you'll have mics that are pointing down to the floor and you get a ton of reflections there. That's a really common one to have, especially if you have uh, mics with a capsule that's not perfectly on access. Also, another common one, mics pointing at one source, but getting a lot of loud bleed from another when you're recording multiple performers at the same time. Again, always check the phase by listening. There are plugins that will monitor the phase for you, but that's not as good as your ears. Use your ears and you'll do a lot better at noticing the lack of bass frequencies that occurs. In terms of phase problems, the drums are the most likely to cause them. This is simply because when you're recording a drum kit, you're probably using more mics on that than anywhere else in your setup. And because of that, and because of how the kit's structured, you can never get them all 100% in phase. But to test the phase of drums, record a sample. Listen to any overhead mics in stereo, then in mono by panning to the center. And then check by flipping the phase switch and go with whichever one works best. If you still notice that they're phasing for the overheads, then move a mic. Next, add the kick and repeat the test. Again, pan everything to the center, flip the phase inversion switch, and figure out if the inversion switch on or off is best for the kick. If not, move it. Then do the snare, then do the rest, and keep going until the entire kit is as good as you can make it. Again, it will never be 100% perfectly in phase. It's just the nature of the beast. But you can get it pretty close. If you have a plug-in like a phase meter, you have a horizontal phase indicator that goes from negative one to zero to positive one. If your signal is effectively mono and there's no phase relation, it will stay pretty centered around zero. There might be a slight amount of deviation, but it's usually gonna be very, very close to zero. If it's stereo and in phase, the indicator will read closer to positive one. If it's stereo but out of phase, it will read around negative one. Again, use the phase inversion switch and adjust the mics to get the best possible output. If, however, you're using an oscilloscope or a goniometer, you have a graphical display that ranges from a solid vertical line to a circle. The closer the output is to a vertical line in the center, the more in phase it is. Perfect down the center won't happen though. There's always going to be some parts going off to the sides. It's gonna be more like an oval, but you want that oval to be as thin as possible. Some tips if something sounds off. First and foremost, change the source. It can usually be because the guitarist is playing with a bad guitar or maybe one of the heads on the drums needs to be replaced. Neck. Change the mic placement. The, mice, the mic placement in the room can be very important. You could have just put the mic accidentally a little too close, or the player could have moved closer. Next, change the placement of the mic in the room, or the player in the room. It could be that what you thought was the best place for the player might have some issues with reflections that are causing phasing. After that, change the mic. Yeah, that could be it. Maybe instead of using the 57, you need to get out the 414s. After that, try changing the mic preamp. It could be that the preamp is delaying everything just enough in the signal chain that it's causing phasing. After that, change the amount of compression or limiting that's used if you're using those pre-console. Next, change the room. Yeah, it could happen. The same room that you used for getting that really nice thick coral texture, all the stone, the huge cathedral ceilings, that's not gonna work too well for recording a string quartet. 
you're going to have a blur. Change the room, change the sound. Following that, change the player. And sometimes this is the best way to make it sound good. Uh, but we'll talk about personnel issues later. They can be tricky. Finally, just try it later. Issues of humidity and temperature can be a huge issue, especially for wooden instruments. You have to take that into consideration. So have your players come early and set their instruments out in the room that you're going to record in. They don't have to tune up, just let the instruments get accustomed to the room and get up to the ambient temperature of the room and the relative humidity level. So now we're going to talk about stereo mic techniques. We'll do individual instruments later, uh, but this is fundamental because you're going to need to set up stereo mic pairs to record pretty much everything when we start bringing artists in. And this will be a huge part of the next quiz, the midterm, and it is definitely going to show up on the final. Why do we use stereo miking? Well, it's really common on instruments like drums, where you use them as overheads, pianos, string sections, or if you have an organ, on a Leslie speaker, so you can get that nice, cool Doppler effect. Or anything else where space is a consideration. Stereo mics provide a sense of placement between the left and right side of the recording. They add depth and distance between each instrument. They provide a sense of distance of the ensemble from the listener, based on where you place them in uh, relation to the players. And there's a sense of space and ambience added to the recording environment. You pick up some of the reflections of the room and just get a little bit of that being there feeling that you don't get with individual mics. There are three main types and techniques of stereo miking. There's what's called a coincident pair, which will occur in XY, uh, the midside, and the bloom line techniques. There is a spaced pair, which occurs in the AB and decatree configurations. And there is a near coincident pair, which is very common in the ORTF and NOS techniques. There's also one other, it's called the baffled omni or the artificial head, which is its own separate thing that we'll get to in a little bit. Coincident pairs is one of the most common ways to set up a stereo pair of mics. It assumes that you're using two directional mics usually identical ones from the factory and specced to a very tight tolerance range, mounted on a stereo bar so that the grills of their capsules are nearly, but not, touching, with the diaphragms angled apart so that they're pointing left and right of the ensemble. The greater the angle between the mic capsules, the wider the stereo spread will be. The most common coincident pair technique is the XY, so-called because the mics effectively form an X, or a Y, depending on how you look at it, by intersecting each other 90 degrees with the capsules one on top of the other. This is the old reliable. You need two identical mics. Again, the capsules are either on top of each other or very, very, very close to it, forming a perfect 90 degree angle. One mic points at the right and the other points at the left. This is extremely common to do with cardioids. Does not work as well with omnis. Super cardioids, you can also do it. Midside, or MS, is a little bit different. This requires a cardioid or omni and a figure eight mic. So the figure eight, which will almost certainly be a ribbon, points so that the front and back section of the capsule are pointing to the sides, while the directional mic points toward the source. Again, the capsules should be almost touching. However, this is not the entirety of the midside. With the midside, you need to pan the directional mic dead to the center, 
Then for one side, you need to pan it all the way to the left and the other should be split so that it's going into a copy uh, channel, but with the phase inverted and panned 180 degrees to the right. This is a great stereo image, especially if the sound source is mostly in the center, but it is weak on large groups because it's biased towards the middle. However, it avoids almost all phasing issues. It's especially good for styles of music like bluegrass where you want to get a sense of space, but still have everybody positioned all around one, or in this case, two mics. If you're using it on a large group, it takes too much distance to build up the source, so you'll want to use spot mics as well to reinforce the image. You need to place the mid-side configuration where the source sounds best in the room. It should be approximately head height or a little lower towards the instruments if they're lower than head height. Now with mid-side, you have to decode the signal. A figure eight mic does not output two signals. So you need to either buy a mid-side decoder or you can emulate one in your DAW. So again, put the center mic on one channel. Copy the figure eight mic to two other channels, pan one of these hard left, flip the phase switch of the second channel, bring up the fader until the signals perfectly cancel each other out, then pan the second side channel hard right and balance with the mids by bringing the mids up. Takes a little bit of practice and this is one we're not gonna use a whole lot. Just know what the configuration looks like and experiment with it on your own if you have time. More common though is the Bloomline Array. This was developed by the sound engineer Alvin Bloomline for EMI Records in 1935. Basically, it's XY, but you're using ribbon mics with figure eight patterns. As a result, it's very similar to XY, but it has much better separation of the left and the right side. However, it must be closer to the source. And unfortunately, it will pick up things behind the mic. It's not necessarily a bad thing though, if you want to record and get some of the ambient room noise as well. Stereo mics and bars. Stereo mics are generally coincident, or there are a couple of near coincidence ones that exist. Usually it's an XY configuration or a bloom line that is built with two capsules mounted into one body. They tend to be very expensive though. They require a special six pin stereo to mono XLR cable adapter, which changes from manufacturer to manufacturer naturally. Stereo bars are much more inexpensive way, usually running no more than about $30. Using these, you can set up a coincident pair, especially if you don't want to use multiple mic stands. It makes everything a lot easier. So to review coincident pairs, you get very good imaging. You have an adjustable spread that goes from narrow and natural to wide. Signals are mono compatible, meaning you get a specially defined left and right from the output. But it's not as wide a spread as you'll get in other techniques, as we'll see very shortly. With the space pair, two identical mics, as close as you can get them, hopefully factory matched, are placed several feet apart, aimed right ahead towards the ensemble, without adjusting the angle towards the center or the sides. These can use any polar pattern, but are generally done with omnis. The greater the spacing of the mics, the greater the stereo spread in the playback, but it tends to make off-center images really unfocused. However, on the upside, you get a very warm sense of room ambience or reverb. It also gives you a great low end, especially if you're using omni condensers. AB is the standard two mic spaced pair. 
If the spacing is too far apart, the stereo spread becomes exaggerated. If it's too narrow, it effectively sounds mono. Typically, this will be anywhere from 10 to 12 feet apart, five to six feet away from the front of an ensemble. Uh, ensemble. And a third center mic can also be brought in as needed if you start to lose a sense of the center. With space pairs, always remember that you can add a spot mic if needed. The Decca tree was developed by Decca in the 1950s. It's a triangle that specifically uses three Neumann M50 Omni mics. The center mic is 10 to 12 feet above the conductor. Left is panned left, right is panned right. Spacing is determined by the size of the ensemble. For an orchestra, the left and right mics are 8 to 10 feet apart. The center is 6 to 7 feet in front of the left and right. It's very common to tilt the mics slightly downward as well, especially if you're using condensers. However, keep in mind that this technique only works with extremely large ensembles. Symphony orchestra, wind symphony, or operas. You would never, ever, under any circumstances, use this with anything smaller, like a string quartet or a band. Here's a picture. You can see the front mic is one and a half meters, or approximately five feet, ahead of the left and the right. The front mic is panned straight into the center, the left mic is panned all the way to the left, and the right mic is panned all the way to the right. That's how the basic decatree configuration is laid out. However, to use a decatree, you need to buy special mounts that have to be flown from the rafters of the room. Because of this, it's very rare to use it outside of professional orchestra halls. So an overview of the space pair. Off-center images are a little hazy. The spread tends to sound exaggerated unless a center mic is added, but it gives you a great warmth and sense of ambience and being in the room. However, there's also possible phasing issues that you have to contend with, so be aware of those. Moving on, we have the near coincident pairs. These include some of my personal favorites. Near coincident pairs are similar to coincident pairs in that you're using two matched microphones. However, the mic capsules are not right on top of each other. You're probably wondering why these are my favorites. Well, it's generally because they give you the best stereo images available. It's really great for making your recording sound in the room. ORTF. This is my personal favorite. It's named after the Office de Radio Diffusion Television Française, who developed it. It uses two identical cardioid mics spaced 17 centimeters or about 7 inches apart at the capsules and angled at 110 degrees. This is meant to roughly kind of put the mics at the position of where your ears are and at the same angle so that the listener is effectively where the two capsules would be. This results in a super accurate placement of instruments within the stereo field. NOS, which is my typical backup plan, is the Niederländische Omrup Stichin. It's Denmark's national broadcaster who developed it. It's very similar to ORTF, but the two cardioids are 11.8 inches or 30 centimeters apart at a 90 degree angle from each other. This means that it's slightly better mono compatibility than ORTF and has a slightly stronger center. That could be better for some things. I typically start off with the ORTF and then switch to NOS if I'm not getting enough of the center image. With the near coincident pairs, you have an extremely sharp image, great localization of left, right, and center. They are highly accurate stereo spreads, 
give a better sense of air and depth in the mix than coincident pairs. They have the width and depth of the bloom line without the extra reverb that you get from having two figure eight mics. This is why I generally recommend that of all the techniques, you start with these and then adjust based on what you're hearing. We also have what's called the Baffled Omni Pair. Baffled Omni uses either two mics or a dummy head with mics inserted that's designed to emulate how humans hear by creating a filter similar to the actual ear canal. If you're not using the uh, dummy head, you can separate two Omnis by a baffle, like a Jekyll disc, which is a hard ceramic disc with foam on either side. Or you could buy a Sheps spherical mic, which is a hard sphere baffle with two mics flush on either side. And then of course there's the Neumann KU100 dummy head with mics positioned inside the ears and some very disturbing mic cables running out from the bottom of the neck like a spinal cord. The level, time, and spectral differences between the mics creates a very very strong and sharp stereo image when using one of these techniques. The image is incredibly sharp and typically is the closest you're going to get to human ear responses. The stereo spread is highly accurate, although it can die away at really low frequencies, which is how the human ear actually hears. Aside from that, low frequency response is otherwise excellent. So those are just a couple of the techniques that you're going to want to be familiar with for stereo miking. Um, again, we're not going to get into any of the specific techniques for individual instruments just yet. That's coming very shortly. Uh, what you want to do for next week, for sure, is to read over chapters 5 and 6 and make sure that you're very clear on how all of these techniques work. The book does a really great job of providing pictures and outlining all of the techniques. You will also want to review these slides, which are already on Blackboard under the content, and generally prep for the quiz next week, which will be on stereo mic placement and patterns. Uh, we'll also do a little bit on mono mics. It's mostly going to be kind of reading the uh, polar patterns, so nothing that you have not covered already. Um, also, there are some videos that I've placed on the Blackboard site that go over basic mic technique. Please review those in advance of the test as well. Um, if you have any questions, I am reachable by email, so send me an email and I will get to it as soon as possible, very possibly on Sunday when I have a extremely long layover. Uh, set between several different airports uh, at Seattle and then later at Chicago. So hope this helps and again check those videos out and read chapters 5 and 6 for the test next week.